Hey there, working preachers. This is Joy J. Moore. We want to extend a huge thank you to all of you who generously responded to this fall campaign. We are happy to report that thanks to your generosity, we secured $10,000 in matching funds. Thank you. We know you rely on this site regularly, and we are grateful that you took the time to let us know what this ministry is worth to you. Thank you for keeping Working Preacher working for you. Welcome to Sermon Brainwave with me, Ralph Jacobson. And with me, Joy J. Moore. And me, Matt Skinner. And me, Caroline Lewis. And this is the podcast for December 5th, 2021, uh, Advent. Two. Uh, the first reading is Malachi 3, 1 through 4. The psalm is Luke 1, 68 through 79. Second reading is Philippians 1, 3 through 11. And the gospel reading is Luke 3, 1 through 6. And Caroline was pointing out uh, there's some really hard names in here, so make sure you have a good reader. Or if you read it, you're the preacher and you read the gospel, make sure you practice it. There's some uh, unusual names here, but of course, this is in part key to uh, to what's going on in this and these opening verses of John the Baptist ministry. And because you have this extraordinary contrast of the location of John's ministry and to whom the uh, the word of the lord the word of god comes comes uh, to john son of zechariah we are reminded and son of elizabeth the barren old elizabeth and zechariah who whom jesus had or whom god has favored whom god has regarded in the wilderness in contrast to the these super important people of the emperor and Pontius Pilate. And so you, that, that those names are not just uh, not to trip you up as the reader and to challenge you, but have everything to do with Luke's theme of, and what we'll get of course in verse six, when, when John is referring to Isaiah, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. So these, these names are, are essential for pointing that out and making that contrast right away that the word of God is coming to these unexpected people in these unexpected places. And we've already seen that, of course, in Luke 1 and 2. Yeah, it's always fun when Advent switches to John, you know, in, in the second week. First week, you've always got some kind of apocalyptic scene and then and now this uh preparatory language and we actually get two weeks of john in year c which will be fun to get a little more insight into john's preaching uh but john's connection to isaiah is so incredibly important and this becomes a, a great way to to use music uh, of course in your in your advent service but also to show how john looks so familiar even though you don't get the specific connections to elijah in in this gospel that, that nobody's going to mistake who who john was uh, or what kind of a person he was and what he thought he was doing as as a prophet and we'll see a lot more of that um again next week as well but to to underscore again which is so you know the knowledge of this is so weak in so many christian congregations of jesus not just as a jew in terms of his lineage, but in terms of his piety and in terms of his practice and uh, a faithful Jew, one deeply embedded in and, and uh, reliant upon Jewish practices, traditions, and teachings, and to help a, a congregation in Advent learn to read the Old Testament, the Old Testament promises in ways that are both uh, distinctively Christian, right, read through the, the lens of Christ, but also generous and open uh, to understanding that this is shared scripture that we're talking about and promises that different faith communities uh, share in particular ways. It's just a lot. You can, John just opens the door to so much interesting conversation. And we haven't even talked about repentance yet. No, but I think too, uh, and 
recognizing that the words that that John speaks here are this section of Isaiah 40, but uh, for the preacher to go back to the entirety of Isaiah 40, which is one of the most you know, gorgeous passages in scripture, beginning with comfort, comfort. So this wider context of Isaiah 40, which is so important for, particularly when you get into next week's preaching of, of John and, you know, you brood of vipers and, but that, but it's all in this context of Isaiah 40 of, of, of God's presence with the exile, with the exiled Israelites. And, opening and comfort and then this and then of course the the ending of Isaiah uh, of Isaiah 40 of Isaiah 40 31 which is so familiar to so many people but those who wait for the Lord shall renew their strength they shall mount up with wings like eagles they shall run and not be weary they shall walk and not faint and so the that the entirety of Isaiah 40 standing behind God or John's ministry, I think is so critical. And, and then as you said, Matt lifts up so many Advent themes that are important for that, that can be really, I think, meaningful for people in terms of comfort and preparation. All flesh shall see salvation and being lifted up, uh, be, be lifted up uh, the promise at the end of the at the end of the chapter. And I, I appreciate that because this, like um, uh, Isaiah 40, uh, as you've mentioned, Caroline, Isaiah 40 is a comfort word that comes in the mid middle of exile. And um, this is uh, the middle of the uh, Jews living in occupied territory. And um, here is this promise being uh, made uh, again uh, or continuously uh, that um, that the 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 high places will be brought down, the low places will be brought up, the crooked places will be made straight. Um, what's broken and um, uh, uh, causing anguish is going to be uh, fixed, uh, repaired, and bring peace. Um, and you can only really receive that if you can really name the brokenness. Uh, and uh, I, I was really struck in this particular reading this year um, uh, with verse six uh, in wanting to ask the question. I mean, verse, verse um, uh, five uh, says, this is what it will look like. But verse six says, all flesh shall see the salvation of God. And I asked the question, what will they, or present tense, what do they see? And uh, it, it might be worth uh, both naming uh, the distress and the anguish of the reality where we are, and then clearly identifying what that comfort will look like in ways not merely of promise, but where are the glimpses uh, right now uh, from our congregational communities into uh, the communities that our congregations exist. I think also too the the backdrop the backdrop of Isaiah and the and the exile, but the reference also in this passage or the location of where John the Baptist ministry begins and takes place in the wilderness, is also an important location or important theme in that that wilderness time was a uh, was a time of formation. Uh, so that going back to going back to uh, numbers, and so that uh, that we that we think about also the way in which Advent becomes this formational kind of reality that uh, that that how is it that we are being formed and shaped by a particular way of being in the world, a, a way of being in the world that is that is preparing that is looking to see the salvation of God. And then, as you mentioned, Matt, uh, a few minutes ago, like, what is it, what does it mean to be uh, in this state of repentance? And so, so that we think of again, Advent as again, not just this waiting, this passive waiting around, but this time of formation that, 
if, if we're standing up and raising our heads, going back to last week's text, and if we're if we're in this uh, in this space of of looking for God's presence, that how is that forming and shaping us? How is that changing the way uh, the the way we are in the world? But where will we be? Where will we be once we get to Christmas? And I hope there that we're imagining a, a kind of formation time here. Should we go to Malachi? I learned I learned more from. Uh... From Maggie, Maggie Odell's commentary on Malachi than I've ever known about Malachi, I think. It's a fantastic commentary. Characteristically fantastic. Yeah. What really, did you learn? Really good. What did I learn? Yeah. In uh, specific. Like well, everything uh, about Malachi? <laughs> yeah. Well, another way you could ask that question is, what did you know about Malachi prior to reading this commentary? No, I, that's what I, I was going to say. But, like, did you know anything about Malachi? But, uh, <laughs> prior to? You know, I, I had always missed the detail about the sons of Levi and that Malachi was spent particularly to, to reform the priesthood, or at least understands himself as, as, uh, as reforming the priesthood and, and, and just spending some time thinking about that. Because my first thought when I hear a priesthood that needs reforming is I think about corruption. I think about all the ways in which people are complicit and, you know, the ways of the world and stuff like that. But the, the but Maggie's commentary, you know, Maggie O'Dell's commentary goes toward essentially what does a priesthood need and how does this now become good news for all the people, mm -hmm. like by extension. And I, I'm taking her word for it that when you read more than Malik, four verses out of Malachi, then we can see that as well. But I found that really helpful as a way of thinking about the, the particularities of Malachi's calling, as opposed to some of those prophets who are, um, I, I don't know, it, it, who's, who's, who kind of present their own, and this isn't just biblical prophets, these are our latter day contemporary prophets, who see their job as merely to speak a word of judgment and not necessary to be around to help with offering the hand up to whatever the next stage is or something like that. And the way she at least presented Malachi the prophet to me was somebody a little bit more um, constructive. <laughs> yeah, it's, I did, I, I did a couple workshops, I think, I think at the Festival of Homiletics last, I think last spring, I presented on prophetic ministry as hope um, that, you know, that a lot of people who uh, consider themselves prophetic preachers, uh, in, in the words of Walter Bergamon, all they do is scold. Uh, but as Bergman highlights in his, what his, is his most influential book, uh, The Prophetic Imagination, it is about hope. And uh, Ma Malachi really follows a long line in the prophets, starting with uh, the, the most ancient of the literary prophets, Amos, that a big amount of their criticism is for the, the, uh, the spiritual leaders, priest and prophet. And uh, I thought you were gonna say you learned about what Fuller's, uh, what a Fuller was. And uh, Fuller's... Geyser taught me that about 15 years ago. So I, <laughs> you really, I you, you knew what a, the Fuller's field was? I'm not saying I remember it today. I remember he taught. <laughs> What is uh, what I've always loved, uh, Malachi is uh, another one of my favorite books, um, uh, when I realized that it wasn't about tithing. Uh, uh, and, and it is this recognition that um, um, the um, corruption, uh, if we use that word, uh, what it is that is done is once again what we see throughout the prophetic uh, challenge, and that is how are the least of these treated? How are the women? How are the orphans? How how are the foreigners treated? And we completely miss that what is being described here is that the religious leaders, those who are supposed to be calling for this um, missional work of, of generosity, of hospitality um, in the land, are the ones who are practicing it, are the very ones who are practicing it. So I really appreciated the commentary. Um, Matt, uh, she indeed does a wonderful job of calling attention to that. And for us to recognize recognize that this is an again an opportunity for us to recognize that what truly gets God um, uh, disgusted is a lack of practices of hospitality 
um, extended by God's people. Um, and so my question that I asked of, of uh, the, of the um, gospel, what salvation are people seeing in that behavior of the people of God? I do think it's, um, I think it's helpful to um, complement the, uh, the stuff in Luke, which includes the psalm, uh, talking about repentance and forgiveness with uh, the, the two metaphors in Malachi. Um, who can endure the day of the Lord that's coming? Because he is a refiner's fire and a fuller's soap. And then uh, they really work out the, the, the metaphor of the refining fire. This, um, this is what's coming for us as spiritual leaders, uh, maybe to think about you're going to be, you're going to be burned until all the dross is gone and you're going to be scrubbed. Uh, did you guys, when you were kids ever get, you know, um, like gravel in a road rash, bike crash cut, and then have to get, have that wound scrubbed out happened to me more than once. Uh, that's the image I think of, uh, that this is what's coming for us. And uh, so it, it does, it's moves, it moves it just beyond, oh, repentance. Yeah, we're going to be repent and forgive it because that turn is going to require a, a purifying action um, to, so that we can be holy. We're back to holiness, uh, Professor Moore. And that, that turn is a return um, that this is um, our created intention. Uh, and and that, that's good news too, that we aren't, um, uh, well, we aren't hopeless, but we, we, we didn't start, turn out bad and, and hopefully we can uh, be made good. It's we were created good and uh, we've, we've um, gone in a different direction. And so this repentance is a return to our true selves uh, who we really are. Um, and I think that in itself is, is good news. If you think of the expectation that the priests are supposed to be the, the ones who offer and practice hope, um, it's asking, it's, it's a challenge to do what they were called to do, not um, uh, the priesthood is, is irredeemable. Um, but no, the priesthood can still be what God called it to be. Uh, I find that as hopeful for us, uh, 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 as uh, hopeful for me every time I fail, um, that God's intention for me is good, and I can do that with God's spirit, with the Spirit's help. So, Luke, again, <laughs> which is the psalm, of course, and it's uh, Zechariah's Benedictus and his prophetic song and i think you know one of the one of the important themes that we have in luke but it's a, a again another interesting angle into a, an important angle into advent and what does it mean to be a, a people of god waiting for the the inbreaking of of god once again is the response is praise. And so what we'll see over and over again in the Gospel of Luke, we've already seen it in Elizabeth's response. We've seen it, of course, with Mary's Magnificat. And then we'll see it in chapter two with the angels, with the shepherds and, and the angels praising God and saying, and then of course, the gospel itself ends with the disciples continually in the temple praising God. And so here we have this act of act of praise on the on the part of Zechariah, that uh, that in, in embodying the way in which it, the fact that all flesh is going to see the salvation of God, and what is our response going to be to all of this? Um, how how is it that how is it that Zechariah gives us words to 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 praise? And to that's that's not about not about thanking God. It's but it's that recognition of God's uh, the recognition of God's favor, the recognition of God seeing us, the recognition of God's regard for all 
and and how will how will we how will we respond to that uh, in in a way that is that is mm, not ne maybe not necessarily worthy of that, but that that to recognize that this is just fundamentally remarkable. <laughs> and and the only thing we really can do is praise. We can't explain, we can't can't really uh, really understand. We can't understand it. We can't explain it. There's an awesomeness that should be present in the time of Advent that uh, that that Zechariah's song reminds us of, I think. I'd add a verse here, at which least. is just simply the uh, the the introduction, one sixty seven, where we learn that this is uh, the result of the Spirit uh, falling upon Zechariah. That the Spirit is uh, very active in in Luke one through three, even into chapter four with Jesus' first sermon, but also that names this as a prophecy, which requires us to do a little bit of nuancing. What is what does that word even mean? Uh, prophecy, but this is part of what's going on. This is part of what John's doing, but this is part of what this advent, this arrival of, of John and Jesus is about, as it's it's raising up a prophetic people to speak prophetically under the guidance of the Spirit. The beginning of Acts will, of course, do the same thing, make the same claims in chapter two at Pentecost. And so it's a way of calling together, it's a way of, well, it's, it's a way of calling the question of why do we even sing at Advent? What are we doing with these hymns? How are they praise? How do they, Caroline, like you said, bring us into mystery? But how do they also speak something and tell something and reveal God in ways that are uh, astounding, that don't match our conventional ways of, of um, seeing the world and assessing what reality looks like and finding God in these, God's expected faithfulness showing up in unexpected means or, or ways. I think that's so. That's such an important uh, point. Absolutely, add because add that verse because nothing really happens in Luke without the Holy Spirit, and that there that praise is a, that's another huge theme, of course, in Luke. So as we're looking forward beyond Advent into this year of Luke, but it's almost as if I mean, if you go back to you know Elizabeth's oracle that we'll get next uh, that we'll get in two weeks, right, the last Sunday of Advent, Elizabeth's oracle to Mary, yeah, Elizabeth was filled with the Holy Spirit, and then goes into her, her blessing of Mary, and that my soul magnifies the Lord, this is a Magnificat, and my spirit rejoices in God, my Savior. Jesus' first sermon, the first thing he does in Luke is, the spirit of the Lord is upon me to bring sight to the blind, let the oppressed go free. And so there's something, you know, that the, these moments of praise, these moments of, of uttering, uttering and acknowledging the mystery and the wonder and the awesomeness of God I'm not really quite sure how to describe this or explain this, but there, it's all, it, it's going back to what you said, Matt. It's like this, the spirit, it, it's an intermingling of you and the Holy Spirit, or it's this, this spirit working through you, or the spirit giving you these words of utterance of praise. And so there's something really quite profound in that, I think, uh, if, especially if we think about the ways in which we often talk to, or how do we talk about the spirit? How do we, how do we think about pneumatology with people and to imagine that the spirit is, is, um, is that gives you that power and gives you that, the possibility and the inspiration and, yeah, I, again, I'm not doing a very good job of explaining that, but there's something really profound in that I don't know, that intermingling or that connectedness with the spirit that's kind of is blowing me, oh, blowing my mind right now. <laughs> well, it gets to that in-breaking. I mean, uh, I would do more than add the verse. I would add the context. I'd go back to the story. Um, during this, the uh, 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 pregnancy uh, with John, uh, Zachariah can't talk. And so it's it's this is this is the explosion of expression. And if uh, if if you put that also in the context of um, of, of Malachi, the priest who is silenced, or the priest whose actions um, um, 
uh, make it uh, make it impossible to hear uh, the the promise of peace of God. Um, these words become uh, by by the work of the Holy Spirit re restoring His voice gives opportunity to just say, according to who God is, God has shown us this mercy, um, and it. it and regardless of the things that we have done, um, that this extension that has been given to us is um, uh, uh, it, it's it's God's favor is redemption, uh, and this is the same mercy that uh, was given to our ancestors, remembering the holy covenant. And now that I've got my voice back, that's what I've got to say. I've got to tell you who God is, and God is the same yesterday and forever, to go back to the verse from last week. So I'd put it more in just the, the verses. I'd put it back in the story to remember um, he's got his voice back, and he's going to tell us who good, how good God is. Thank you. Um, I think you got to start by saying these are the best nine months of Liz's flight, right? Uh, except for I can't talk. <laughs> you know, so... Wow, that was that was great nine months. But now he's going to talk again. And uh, I think the best thing I've learned about Luke in all the years of doing this podcast uh, with you guys is uh, that the this theme that we were talking about, which I had not been aware of, that the Holy Spirit is uh, prophesying through many of the many people all through the early chapters of Luke. It's the Spirit constantly. One small thing about verse 67, which I think should, has to be added, is that prophesying is a verb here. It's not, he didn't speak a prophecy as, as if a prophecy is a thing. It's, it's an activity um, that he is prophesying. And I think that helps get away, that helps me uh, think more about the whole practice of uh, preaching uh, in um harmony with uh with the with the biblical prophets that it's it's an activity not just a thing that was spoken i should probably say something about philippians we had a prayer last week with first thessalonians and now we've got paul as well talking about prayer uh even next week there's it's kind of prayerish. i don't know if that's the was done by design or not uh, but again, talk about endurance, which you got obviously the case last week with First Thessalonians chapter three. Here in Philippians, of Paul's in a very different state and writing to a very different congregation. But uh, this comes out from Carla Works' commentary that this is could be could have been Paul's last letter. Uh, he's concerned about this congregation in Philippi, but his prayer is about completion and about endurance and about them. Well, he'll say this later in the letter working out their salvation in fear and trembling and not waiting passively for a leader to come along and, and make everything all right, but for them to trust God's presence among them and to carry on that same kind of ministry that perhaps we see, Paul, of course, doesn't say this, but perhaps we see modeled in the Benedictus from Zechariah and the Magnificat from Mary and Simeon and Anna. Uh, 